Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Baer. I'm Dean of the College of Forest Resources at the University of Washington. And I wish to welcome all of you to this 15th Denman Forest Reissue Series entitled Trust and Transition, Perspectives on Native American Forestry. We look forward to an exciting and informative program today as we discuss a series of issues dealing with the stewardship of the natural resources located on the forest lands managed by Native American tribes across America in cooperation with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. This subject is in keeping with the purpose of the Denman Forestry Issue Series, which is to provide information and discussion on timely forestry and natural resource issues, and to inform and educate landowners, professional citizens groups, students, and the general public. These programs are made possible through the support of the Denman Endowment for Student Excellence in Forest Resources in our College of Forest Resources. And they support the college's vision of world-class and internationally recognized knowledge relevant to environmental and natural resource issues. The mission of our college is to study and investigate the sustainability and functionality of complex natural resource and environmental systems in both natural and managed environments using an interdisciplinary approach across multiple spatial and temporal scales to include our urban, suburban, and wildland landscapes. In our college, we focus on programs in sustainable forestry, sustainable urban ecosystems, and sustainable forest enterprises. Sustainability serves as the goal for all of our programs, and we use the term to include all resources, such as timber, shrubs, water, wildlife, or insects, for example, to consider the needs of future generations as well as those of the present. And we strive for a dynamic equilibrium that balances ecological functions and conditions with social, cultural, and economic factors. This slide illustrates the notion of the dynamic balance across the just mentioned metrics. And even though the ellipses are shown as being about equal in area, it should be clear that depending upon ownership objectives, it is likely that one set of metrics may be assigned more importance in the decision-making process than another. For example, tribal land managers would likely place considerable weight on the social cultural measures of success relative to the balance sought by other forest land owners. Not made clear by this simple diagram uh, is the shift over time in the weight applied to the different metrics as landowner and societal preferences change. Today, we wish to focus on a variety of issues related to the stewardship of forest managed by tribal natural resource managers in collaboration with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We will hear presentations this afternoon covering three general topics. A national overview of tribal forestry issues, followed by some talks that look at the opportunities and challenges facing tribal forest managers, and then some discussion of forest health and bioenergy issues, illustrating the balance between ecology and economics that was referred to in one of the prior slides. These presentations will discuss many issues, and I'm just going to list a couple of the ones that I pretty sure most of the speakers will touch on in one way or the other because these affect the management of the tribal forest lands across America. One will probably be drawing your attention to the lack of funding, funding from the federal government, which is a huge impediment to the success of tribal stewardship. Other issues will include clarifying the complex relationship between the tribes and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Forest health concerns are widespread across most of the inland west and affect many, if not all, of the forest landowners in that part of the country. Some speakers will address the complexity of tribal forest management. How do we satisfy the numerous economic, social, and cultural goals that the various tribes have articulated? 
What is the role of third party forest certification in the management of these tribal forest lands? And lastly, some speakers will address the need to broaden the concept of sustainability to include all natural resources as I defined it earlier. Before we turn to a discussion of these topics and we get to our prime speakers, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers for joining us at this event. Some have traveled considerable distance to be with us today and we greatly appreciate their presence here with us. I also wish to acknowledge the assistance of people and organizations who helped us put this program together. First, the Intertribal Timber Council. Second, Dr. Gary Morishima from the Quinault Indian Nation. Mary Parker from the Macaw Nation who will be our moderator. And Larry Mason from the University of Washington College of Forest Resources. We could not have done this program without the assistance of these people and, and the Intertribal Timber Council. So joining us today, today then are speakers to address the three themes that I outlined earlier and I'm sure they'll address other complex issues as well. And they come to us from several tribes, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and from the University of Washington. Our topic is trust and transition perspectives on Native American forestry and our moderator is Meredith Mary Parker, CEO of the Macaw Forestry Enterprises. I just wanted to say a word about Mary before she comes up here. She's, in addition to her responsibilities with the Macaw, she is um, also the president of the Board of Trustees for the Macaw Cultural and Research Center, president of the Nia Bay Chamber of Commerce, a member of the tribe's election board, and has represented the Macaw tribe on the executive board of directors to the Inner Tribal Timber Council since 1990. And she's also chair of the ITC's operations committee. And as I mentioned, she was also instrumental in helping us put this program together. So Mary, I'll turn the podium over to you to introduce the speakers. Our third session today is on forest health and bioenergy. And our first speaker of, this, of the third session is Phil Rigdon. Philip Rigdon has been the Yakima Nation Deputy Director of the Department of Natural Resources for the last two years. DNR programs work to manage, co-manage, and protect the Yakima Nation's ancestral, cultural, and treaty resources. Programs within DNR include Yakima Nation fisheries, forestry, wildlife, environmental management, cultural resources, Tribal Historic Preservation Office, Water Resources, and other related natural resource programs. Previously, Phil worked with the Yakima Nation Tribal Forestry Program as the Fuels Manager, Timber Sale Administrative Forester, and Forest Development Forester. Mr. Rigdon obtained a BS in Forest Management from the University of Washington in 1996 and earned a Master of Forestry from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies in 2002. Phil? Okay. Thank you, Mary. First of all, I, wanna, I would like to thank the um, University of Washington College of Forest Resource and the Denman Lecture Series. This is a true honor to come here and, and speak today. And so, um, Again, my name is Philip Rigdon, and I'm the Deputy Director of Natural Resources for the Yakima Nation. Um, the Yakima Nation is located on the, it's on the, east, it's the east slopes of the Cascade in south central Washington. It's about, it was bit, started in a, with the Treaty of 1855 um, and the, it's basically the tribe um, was originally 14 different tribes and bands that went over 10.3 million acres and we were put onto the reservation was 1.3 million acres. The, um, the reservation itself is it's about 650,000 acres is forested land and the rest is rangeland and agriculture land. Um, the forested area we call the closed area and it's where our land, where most of our operations do happen. Um, management of forest resources on the Yakima Res Reservation, is, it's based on a general policy within the Yakima Nation Land and Natural Resource Policy Plan. This sets broad um, policy guidelines for the management of our resources. From this, the Yakima Nation has a um, forest management plan which provides the direction and guidance for forest, um, forest land management activities. Um, the, the land is managed 
through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, and in general, co-managed by the Yakima Nation Department of Natural Resources. Forest management history on the Yakima Reservation, prior to the Treaty of 1855, our land too was managed by, through fire, mainly through fire, by my ancestors and, and the people, the Yakima Nation people. Um, from that, from the 1880s through the 1930s, sheep grazing was, was done by non-Indians non on the tribal lands for those years. Um, cattle grazing from 1950s to the present um, is still part of one of the major activities. In the early 1900s, fire suppression became the big activity. And the, from 1940s plus, it, has, it was an aggressive fire suppression activity. And in 1940, the start of our first timber sale program began. Timber sales on the Yakima Reservation, like I said, it started in the 1940s, but the 1940s and 50s, um, it was basic, basically um, salvage harvesting, going out and finding dead and dying trees. And, and that changed in the 1960s, 70s, and through, through the middle of the 1980s. And in this time, it was more selective harvesting, going out and picking they would, they would select the largest diameters out there and bring those trees in. Those were the trees with the most value. Since the 1980s to through, through the current times, the tribe has changed our direction and a lot of our, our forest management activities are aimed at um, ecosystem health and trying to restore our forest into what it used to be, which was the east side of the Cascade is the interior west where it's on fire adapted ecologies and, and so we used to have you know, savanna, pine, like stands that you see in this picture. Within those time frames, and I think these numbers are relevant, we've harvested, this is in million board feet. Over time, we've harvested, you know, nearly 10 billion board feet. Our timber resources are essential to the culture, social, and eco economic needs of the tribe. The Yakima Nation has the largest volume um, Forest lands within the Bureau of Indian Affairs have more than 650,000 acres containing an estimated 10 billion board feet of, of timber. This includes ar areas designated as commercial forests of roughly 450,000 acres with an estimated standard volume of around 8 billion board feet. We operate one of the largest forestry programs nationally with an annual allowable harvest of 143 million board feet. Balanced on our forest management goals and objectives. Our approach to forestry is basically, um, we want our forest to look like a forest, to function as a forest, and with, within that, our concerns is forest health, um, the ecosystems that, and their health, but at the same time, it's about revenue and employment. It's about jobs and, and people working in the woods. It's dealing with threatened and endangered species and providing for those species that, that are important to, to us both um, as the animals themselves, but also significant for our culture and so forth. Big game habitat, water quality, riparian and meta protection, these are some of the many things that we deal with. And, and when you talk about the balance, it, it's a balance between forest health and ecosystem health. How do you weigh the, to do these things? It's with the timber value versus um, threatened and endangered species. It's utilization tied with, you know, our own culture values within our community. It's the economics and you know, balance with our own spirituality of the land, of the, the places that we live and value. So when you talk about ecosystem management, it's maintaining our forest health. It's sustaining the resources that we depend upon. It's retaining the diversity of forest habitat types across the landscape. This can be seen through this map here where, you know, in the, under our current forest management plan, we have management emphasis areas. And the main, you know, green is the general forest, and that's where most of our forestry activities are out. But we, we still have canyon and riparian areas. The orange are out towards the, the east of the, the reservation. That area is the wildlife winter ha wildlife habitat. We still do activities there, but the priority is to provide those functions and those services within that landscape. Through that, the tribe manages our land through in a co-management thing with the, the BI forestry, we have a tribal forestry program that does the forest development, the, the fields management, fire management is now run out of the tribe. We do the archeological surveys, fisheries, cultural resources. All these programs are involved in the decision making into within an interdisciplinary process. And it's an important part of 
how we come to decisions. And sometimes it's challenging, challenging in all facets. But when it comes back to it, what our purpose and what we're trying to do, what we're, what, how we approach it, it's an environmental protection while we're trying to aim for economic prosperity, which leads into our social well-being. All of these things are, are part of, you know, for us to, we need to meet our, our current needs and values without compromising the values of, and management options of future generations. This includes, you know, the forest and how they function and, and work within the landscape. It also is value in our traditional foods and medicines and the, these things that, they, that we value as, as a community and that our people still depend upon and use today. Huckleberries are, is another one of our foods. It's about water quality and providing the sustenance of life that, that our people recognize and value. It's about wildlife. Um, we have one of the largest wild, wild horse populations on the <laughs> reservation and elk and, and spotted owl is an integral part of, of that you know, we value and try to balance as we approach management on our lands. It's about fisheries. We, Yakima Nation is also one of the fisher, you know, we're one of the Columbia River tribes that, have, that are dependent and have always been dependent upon the salmon and for those resources that it provides. Revenue and employment, people working in the woods, the income generated through forestry, these, these are all the things that we value. These are all the things that are important when you, when, as we approach our activities. And so I'm going to move forward into, um, you know, how do, how do we get to the economic part of where we're heading to? And, and for the Yakima Nation, there was a lot of things that, that set up to there. And some of it has to do with, with um, some insect and disease problems that we had that started during the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, our, we had a major forest health problem. We had a large insect and disease complex. It, it was 15, um, it was a 15 year western spruce budworm outbreak. 150,000 acres were defoliated annually. A bark beetle population that, you know, it was very significant across the landscape. An estimated billion board feet of mortality was being witnessed. We had two tribal um, declarations of emergency in 1997 and 2000. And through all this, you know, we had an increasing risk for, of catastrophic fire. Um, this is just a map of two, in 2000 where there's 205,000 <laughs> acres of defoliation that occurred. And the problem stems from, you know, increased stand density, which decreased tree vigor, which made the, the forest more susceptible to large scape, landscape, insect and disease and fire risk. And so this is kind of a graph that shows, you know, acres of defoliation by western spruce budworm. And it started out in 1985. We, in 1990, where the orange arrow, there was some treatments that were, um, some spray projects that were implemented, but no civil culture activity really was implemented. From that time on, the tribe took on that we want to do the spray where it's appropriate, but to address these issues, we need to civil culture address the forest health on the reservation. So the first strategy and the short-term strategy was rec recover the value of the dead and dying trees. The second long-term strategy was to promote the development of more resi um, resilient and sustainable forest. And so during, from 1993 through, through 2000, you, you know, 2002, we went from, you know, 90 million board feet we were harvesting and it jumped all the way up to, in 1999, 226 million board feet was harvested off the reservation. Mainly a salvage, you know, 80% was Grand Fur and Doug Fur that were being heavily impacted by the insect and disease. During that time frame, we had a, a bunch of timber cells, 288 acres, 88,000 acres were harvested with, uh, and this, show, this map kind of shows where those timber cells were and, and how we planned to do them. Our approach, you know, this was what many of our stands looked like prior to doing activities, and this was after treatment. We still wanted our forest to look and function as a forest. We wanted those, those values that we saw as important to our community and to, to the people that live and depend upon our forest. 
And so from, from this, and this goes into the Yakima Forest products, um, the 10,000 acre fire complex in 1994, there was a huge fire and Yakima Nation established the Yakima Forest products. And it, it first started as a log sort yard. From this, dealing with them, the large western spruce bloodworm infestation, the Yakima Nation, we had the opportunity to develop our infrastructure. And that was the next stage in what, what our plans were and what we're doing. Um, prior to 1994, timber was sold on the open market and logs were processed outside of the tribal community. The Yakima Forest was approved by our general council, which is, is our electing body in 1994. Inten the intention was to fully utilize and add value to the timber supplied off our lands. And phase one was a log store yard established in 1995. It, it came from, it brought the wood from, from the fire in 1994. Phase two, we started a small sawmill in September of 1988. That, it's a hew saw and it's four inch to 12 inch diameter logs. Phase three involves a large sawmill and that opened in June of 2003. Um, in, in general, um, we started out with a joint venture with uh, Van Porn International, which was a, a timber company. We moved to a management agreement between the Yakima Nation and Van Porn, and over time we've shifted in from 1998 to 2001, it was a consultant agreement, and now the Yakima Nation ourselves, we run that totally by um, the Yakima Force products without it, that help. But it was an important part to get started, the infrastructure, the capital, and those parts of things, and that is a big part of, of the thing. So the Yakima Forest Products is the small sawmill, 35 million board feet annually. Um, the large sawmill has 80 million board feet capacity. It employs anywhere from 300 to 350 people. And more than 90% of the members are, dis are, are tribal members, descendants, or family. And from here, I'm going to go back into, well, so what are the economic impacts for that, that the tribe adds into South Central Washington? to the regional economy and so forth. Um, Yakima Nation timber is an important primary resource to both the local regional economy and providing employment in the manufacturing of lumber and other wood products. Approximately 1,000 to 1,500 Eastern Washington households have a primary wage earner dependent upon um, Yakima timber for their employment. Yakima Nation spends $2 million annually for logging, hauling operations, and other activities in the woods. The tribe invests over $2 million for road improvements and over a million dollars of, of our own funding into forest development activities for reforestation and so forth. And the, it's our tribal contractors and, and our tribal members that do those activities in, those, in the woods. Yakima Forest Products has grown from um, a, log, a log yard to a major lumber manufacturing facility today worth over $70 million in building equipment and inventory. Total sales of, of lumber, logs, and byproducts was nearly $90 million in 2005, and these sales reached into 42 states within the union. And so the Yakima Forest Products is the fifth largest lumber producer for one mill site. It ranks 50th within the, the nation for all mills. It has an annual payroll of about $11 million. Um, 300 to 350 employees, like I said, 90% are tribal, are tribal members, descendants, or, or spouses. And about 160 million board feet is produced annually. And so, you know, the, the importance of these things and, and how we do things, is, it's an important. And so in 2004, the Yakima Forest Parks was voted the Minority Business um, of the Year by the University of Washington. This was determined by the actual sales, the number of employees, and the impact that we had on the, that the Yakima Nation has on the community. And so the question goes into, and this, I'm kind of winding this down, but the question goes into what are our, what are our future needs? What is important into how we approach things? The timber market is really volatile these days, and so dependence upon those becomes difficult. And it's moving towards energy development and the things that, in cooperation between agencies and, and some of the things that John Wakanda and many of the other speakers have, have talked about. And that's, those are the things that we are hoping to see. And, you know, one plug for the researchers, I guess, is important to, to also know. I think Indian communities across um, America 
are contributing significantly into these economies that, and, but we end up on the short end of the funding for our programs. And, but we add, you know, $22 million of, of jobs. We add, you know, $11 million of, of jobs here. And, and it, I think, you know, one of the big needs that is out there that, that should be addressed is, is what is the contributions of any country and our resources that come back into, you know, the United States and, and adds into the value of, of our people. And I think that is, is where, you know, I hope that, that University of Washington or other folks can invest some time and effort into to really quantifying those things. With that, I thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you, Phil. Our second speaker on the uh, Forest Health and Bioenergy uh, session is uh, Randy Friedlander. Randy is a member of the Colville Confeder Confederated Tribes and a graduate of Washington State University with a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Management and Forest Manage Management in 1995. He has worked as in forestry since 1987 when he started as a high school intern. He is currently employed at the Mount Tolman Fire Center on the Colville Indian Reservation as the Assistant Fire Management Officer. And uh, Randy's um, going to speak this afternoon on advancing forest health. First of all, I'd like to thank the University of Washington for this opportunity to come here and speak today. It is quite an honor. So as Mary said, I'm <clears throat> from the Colville Confederated Tribes. Our reservation is located in eastern Washington. It's approximately 1.4 million acres in size, and this is one of the signs you'll see as you come into our reservation. Uh, we have a very active forest management program, and by active, uh, we, I, we harvest 78 million board feet a year annually. That's our allowable annual cut at this time. Um, all of our forest harvest activities are done through a, our integrated resource management plan. So that's following the standard of, you know, including all the different resource uh, disciplines, fisheries, wildlife, forestry, um, social, the social aspect, cultural aspect. So there's a lot of different, a lot of involvement there. Um, we have, uh, meetings regularly, weekly, to figure out what we want to do. Um, we have an excellent staff, talented, experienced. Um, as mentioned before, we have shrinking budgets also. So we're always looking for more cost-effective ways to try to manage our forest. So our vision, where do we get that from? Uh, I think you've heard it here before. Our vision comes from kind of a pre-European condition. And by that, meaning a, a landscape that's dominated, that was carved by fire. Um, this would have uh, produced a mosaic of large open pine stands. So some of our traditional uses are hunting, fishing, uh, utilizing medicinal and food plants. Aesthetics are really important to our tribe. Uh, they really want our forest to look nice, so we try to, we try to make that happen. And also, recreation is, is important, whether it's hiking or uh, vision, vision quests or just personal time out in the, out in the forest. So uh, the next question is, how do we get to that vision? Um, I think, you know, with many idealists, I think you, you think, well, we'll sit back and it'll happen. And you sit and you wait, and pretty soon a catastrophic fire comes whipping through and it's all gone. <laughs> So much for elk hunting and deer hunting, berry picking, root digging. So what we do is we utilize uh, vegetation. We do a process. Um, I like to think of it as simulating nature through vegetation manipulation. So with people in homes in the equation now, it makes it hard to just let a fire burn at will. Um, a lot of the ecosystems are um, out of whack as far as the stocking densities and everything are such that you know, they almost need a fire to rip through it or, you know, or you have to do something with it. So we choose to do something with it. Um, like Phil was talking about, economics are important, jobs are important. So we, we do log, and logging is one method that we use to uh, reduce the stand densities. So we favor species that would have normally occurred many years ago, referred to as serial species, uh, that would 
in a lot of cases um, include ponderosa pine for us. With our logging, we still utilize uh, a lot of the past, the logging uh, equipment from the past, and we also use, uh, utilize newer technologies uh, like harvesters and foraders. Um, we utilize the mechanical methods would be like an excavator, and we use those for thinning. And we also use fire extensively. Last year, our fire program uh, treated nearly 10,000 acres. Of that, about 4,000 acres of that was actually burned through underburning or hazardous fuel reductions or wildland urban interface. The next problem, if you're going to log, then you're going to create a lot of slash, and we've kind of heard that already. So um, what are you going to do with that? So you can slash some of our current slash treatments have been uh, burning it and uh, also mechanically piling it. Um, one estimate, and I'll show you how I arrived at that in a little bit, is that we produce somewhere anywhere between 70,000 to 120,000 tons of biomass just from the tops of the trees yearly. So you can have this beautiful looking stand, everything looks great, and then you've got a nice fire bed right below it. So that's, you know, was another task that we looked at. Okay, what are we going to do to deal with that? So first I'll show you, these are some of the traditional methods. This is a hand crew utilizing a drip torch and they are doing a burn, a broadcast burn here. And you can see in the picture that there's a lot of uh, slash logging debris out, out in the unit there. Uh, you saw another picture earlier. This is a hella torch and it's doing a broadcast burn. So this site was a, a stand that was dominated by climax species, trees that were there that wouldn't be there if fire was persistent. So this was a conversion site here. This is a pile that's being burned. So are there other uses for biomass? Is there anything else that you can do with it? <coughs> and, and the answer is yes. We did a large scale biomass study uh, that was just completed last year. And, and I'll go over some of the results in a minute, but basically we chipped, instead of burning all that material in the forest, uh, we brought the material in and we chipped it and we hauled it off-site to uh, our cogen unit, cogeneration unit. So just a little highlight of our project for our biomass project was uh, we had about 600 acres were involved in the study. Uh, we harvested uh, one, 1 1.6 million board feet from that acreage. The biomass yield tons per acre was 2.8 tons per acre, and the biomass yield on a tons per thousand board foot, which I was wanting to arrive at so we could get good estimates, was about a one to one. So we had a ton of biomass per thousand board feet. Of course, this is on the eastern side of Washington State, so I, who knows if you could apply that anywhere else. Uh, but this was for us and for our study, so it worked. Um, so the feasibility study was to look at, can we get the tops out of the woods with a uh, merchantable timber op or a commercial timber operation and utilize it at the uh, tribe's cogeneration facility? So in order to do that, it included uh, whole tree skidding, making sure that the top was attached to the last merchantable piece of wood. Um, I did hear some presentations in Denver at a biomass conference, and without the commercial harvest operation, costs can run up around $1,000 per acre. So you'll see here in a minute some of the, what our costs were looking like. One of the other things we did here is we had no follow-up slash activities. So you'll see in a couple pictures that there were no other slash to be removed. So this is... Uh, trying to get this in a dollar per thousand basis for comparison. So the biomass study with the uh, chipping operation was around $4.70 a thousand. Lop and scatter was uh, $5.77 a thousand and excavator piling $23.08 a thousand. So every per thousand. Now this $4.70 uh, just to give you a qualifi qualifier on that, we were receiving $10 at the gate, at the gate meaning at our facility per green ton for that material. So 
you would actually add on a higher cost to that, but because we weren't paying that cost, then it wasn't added on as a cost. So uh, that's what we're looking for, is how do we get the job done cheaper with less money? So that's why you see this figure. We, have, we do have a detailed biomass feasibility study available if anybody's interested. Um, they can just get a hold of me later. So some of the biomass results, significant ones, was that utilizing biomass can be cost effective. I says I put there is, but it can be. It is in our situation. Um, hazardous fuels are reduced significantly. Um, that's huge. I mean, if you're talking about the risk of having a fire versus you know, a little bit of comfort knowing that you're going to have a fire and it's going to go through and it's going to stay on the ground. It's not going to be a total stand replacement fire, wiping out all of the aesthetics and all of the, you know, habitat, critical habitat. So um, part of our study, there's always a question. You're removing all that biomass. Are you leaving anything for nutrient cycling? Part of our study, we had a consultant from Denver that actually looked into that and you know from the results the nutrient levels that were in the soil after the biomass re was removed was very good compared to say a catastrophic stand replacement fire and I suppose that seems pretty obvious but you know we just wanted to show that um, in some cases tree planting can be done immediately following logging it was amazing um, you know I've been involved in forest development in my in the past 15 years and uh, that's always a dilemma you get the trees you grow them you try to get all the timing right and you know and this the stands not prepped it didn't get burned it didn't get mechanically piled you know so what do you do it was amazing we had the trees we had extra trees left over we had a site that the biomass came off of and we were able to go out right after logging I mean it was logged that winter we went out that spring planted it and the trees are just doing awesome there you know like I said there's higher nutrients um, it's just it's just been really good and part of the the other thing I noticed right off the bat was that um, we didn't have invasive species in there because we didn't burn it we had a lot of native plants coming back right away so this is just an example of one of our biomass decks and uh, I was given a presentation earlier and, and made a reference that we have you have to be specific when you talk about biomass piles because I told the logging contractor I want a biomass pile right here here and here and it looked like one of the previous slides with the pile that was on fire it was really jack strong so you really have to be specific and reference a deck in that case um, one thing to note um, in this particular slide it's mainly Douglas fir and Douglas fir and for the, we brought it all in for the study just to quantify the amount, but Douglas fir typically can go towards, say, a stud for a, a hue wood is what it's referred to as. But pine is really a problem. We very seldom get that utilized. Right now it's being utilized in a pulp market, but the pulp market generally goes down the tube here before too long. So this is an example of uh, Douglas fir stand. Um, you know, we've... We still, we could regenerate it, but you know, with aesthetics and wildlife and all that other, and some other concerns, we did an inter intermediate cut. Um, you can see the fire would remain on the ground in this scenario. Um, I, I did a lot of field tours through this area, and it was almost like somebody was releasing the animals on cue, like, you know, okay, they're coming, get ready, go. <laughs> and uh, it was really neat. So we saw elk, uh, moose, deer, coyotes, bears, and uh, it was just amazing. I, and I really think a lot of it is attributed to the native plants. They were coming in. They, this stand had no vegetation in the under, understory to begin with because it was so dense and uh, portions of it. And uh, anyway, so I think they were after that succulent vegetation down below. This is just an example of a pine stand that was, uh, had the biomass removed. So from the biomass study, it was really apparent that um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into the energy portion. And it, our tribe, our council governing body decided that they needed to hire an energy director. So, so the tribe did do that. Um, also, just to, 
for your information, our tribe has a 13 and a half megawatt cogeneration facility. It's pretty old. It was built to consume hog fuel. It wasn't built to be efficient with energy production. And so we're looking at maybe uh, seeing what we can do to, to look at that and maybe um, upgrade it. So another thing is that our tribe is looking at, um, at the possibility of installing a biomass heating unit at our tribal greenhouse. So this last year we received some money from economic development and we did a, a contract with the University of Washington and our tribe has a really good working relationship with this university and um, anyway they, we hired three graduate students working in business and they did a market study and a um, feasibility study on installing a biomass heating unit um, to replace a propane unit and they did an excellent job for us and we're looking at um, possibly right now we're going through the contract phase of that and um, trying to we're wor working with a uh, design and build engineering firm out of Spokane and hoping that we're gonna um, be able to get that project underway um, we've already got the groundwork laid out and a nice market study and a good business. We got a business plan out of that deal also. So we're really, really tickled about that. So at this time, I want to, I haven't really had the opportunity to thank the Division of Energy and Mineral Development for helping fund the biomass project. And I'm guessing that they're going to be able to see this. So I'd like to thank them, especially Feline Haven at this time. And also, I'd like to thank the, um, University of Washington and their business program and especially Michael Vershow. He was excellent to work with on this uh, greenhouse project. And also the UW business students, Kaya, Ben, and Nicole, and I'm sure they'll know who they are. And uh, also McNeil Technologies for helping us with our primary contractor on the biomass. So thank you for your time. Our last speaker on the forest health and bioenergy is Cal Makamoto. Cal is serving as a project manager for the Warm Springs Biomass Energy Project. He has, he has worked, he has over 26 years working in Indian forestry. As manager of Mukamoto, Mukamoto Associates LLC, he is also a member of the Board of Directors for the Forest Stewardship Council and has served as Vice Chair of the Board of Directors for the Macaw Forestry Enterprise and on boards for the Quinault Indian Nation and the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs. Cal served as a member of the Indian Forest Management Assessment Team, a congressionally mandated team to review the status of Indian forestry that we heard from uh, Professor Franklin. Cal is a certified forester of the Society of American Foresters. He received his Bachelor of Science from Humboldt State University and his MBA from the University of Washington. Cal? Well, thank you. This is a great pleasure to talk here at the University of Washington, and I'm happy to be here. I'd like to thank the Intertribal Timber Council for this opportunity, the Denman Lecture Series, and the University of Washington. Go dogs! <laughs> All right. Well, I think we've already gone through this quite a bit. We have a growing problem in the United States, and we know that it's growing. We have accumulations of fuels. The GAO several years ago identified 190 million acres of forest lands in the West at risk to loss of fire. On reservations, the story is not that much better. About 9.6 million acres are in what we call category three, which means that they are at significant risk of wildfire or insect and disease uh, issues. Uh, you remember back in the earlier presentations, there's only about 18 million acres of uh, timberlands. 9.6 is in this category three. This is a significant issue. Basically, in our area, what we've decided is that 100 years of fire suppression has led to a high level of accumulation of small diameter trees. We're really good at suppressing fires. Now we've got to figure out what we do with all that stuff. Hazardous forest fuels, as you all know, this is kind of for the obvious, but hazardous forest fuels threaten people, cultural resources, tribal forest assets, and uh, wildlife habitat, watersheds, and air sheds. The issue for us, at least in Warm Springs, I, I'm the manager of the Warm Springs Biomass LLC, which is a, a wholly owned enterprise of the Confederate Tribes of Oregon. But we want, what we're doing is we want to expand the current operation of the Warm Springs power plant to 15.8 megawatts of power. This is a forest health project. And the issue that we're facing is that federal land surrounding the reservation threatens tribal forest lands. Tribes have legally protected treaty hunting fishing, pasturing, and gathering rights on BLM and U.S. forest lands, 
and there are more acres requiring treatment than appropriations to treat them. Uh, we down at Warm Springs have come up with what we call a market solution, a pathway to forest health. And basically, you know, we can deal with the small logs and stuff. We can make lumber out of them. But what do you do with all that other stuff? And as Randy has pointed out, you can make energy. And that's our strategy. Uh, basically, it's a real simple strategy. We take unhealthy stands, we thin them, we make them into healthy stands. We take the products that we thin uh, either into a small log processor or make lumber out of it, or we create hog fuel and create electricity through a plant. Again, here's a real simple cycle. And when I took business school here at University of Washington, they called this the money machine. But basically, we would thin the forest, use the products to create biomass or convert small logs into products, energy and lumber, and sell that product for revenue, thus creating market for more material. Pretty simple. Uh, already biomass, and the reason why we took, chose biomass to electricity was because it's a proven technology. And here's a USDA DOE report from 2005 that says biomass is already making key energy contributions in the United States in 2003. It has surpassed hydropower, and this is kind of interesting for the Pacific Northwest, as, a, as the largest domestic source of renewable energy. And biomass currently supplies about 3% of the total energy needs in the United States. Now, may, a large portion of that is coming through plants just like Randy's up in Colville through cogeneration operations. Here's a, a, a continued in that report. There was a study kind of estimating what might be available as far as biomass in the United States. And it shows here that there's a, probably about over a billion, a billion tons of uh, biomass available every year. Of that, forest makes up about 360 uh, eight, almost 400 million uh, tons of biomass a year from forest sources. And actually, that was a very conservative study. So this, uh, basically, in our area, we find that uh, in the forest around area that we get various uh, yields of bi biomass, bone dry tons per acre. And basically, the takeaway from message from this is that we've learned that when we look at the forest, you get about 10 bone dry tons per acre on, a, on, a, on an average basis. However, there are other fuel sources when you're thinking about biomass uh, power as far as, a, uh, as far as a potential for a solution to forest health. And those would be uh, sawmill residuals, logging residuals, landing piles, uh, clean urban wood, and it has to be very clean. Actually, clean urban wood is one of the greatest potentials outside of forest fuels for uh, powering these plants. And in fact, if you're looking at these plants, you need, and I'll get into this, you'll need, you need the clean urban wood in order to make the plant economically viable. Uh, here's kind of a, a mock-up of what might look like an income statement for an average plant. You know, right now, the, the, all the benefits that we can talk about, I'll go into the benefits of biomass, are not paid for through our electricity price. So we're only getting a range of probably about 5.5 to 6.5 cents per, per kilowatt. Less operations and maintenance, which is about 2, and a half, two to 2.3 two, 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 cents per kilowatt. Less fuel, which is... Averaging, we can probably afford about two, two and a half, two and a half cents per uh, kilowatt. Now, what's not up here is the uh, depreciation, which if you depends on which uh, rules that you want to follow. However, uh, you might want to put three cents there, so you can see the imbalance in the income statement there. Uh, these things really, these uh, uh, really depend upon uh, production tax credits and so on to make these things work. The kil kilowatt cost of fuels, forest fuels, unfortunately, are the most expensive. Of course, you know, the thing we're trying to take care of is the most expensive to bring down to us. So it, you know, in our area, it probably can run up to about 4.9 cents per kilowatt to bring down into our area. What we do is we try to offset it with mixturing, mi mixing in clean urban wood, which ranges from 1 cent to 3.5 cents per kilowatt delivered, depending on where it's coming from. Uh, as I said earlier, production tax credits are very necessary for uh, putting these plants online because of the needing to cover the uh, cost of the plant. And uh, most, in fact, most renewable energy projects require production tax credits, and this is a federal production tax credit. Currently, for, for wind, it's 1.8 cents per kilowatt, but for biomass from forest, open loop biomass from forest fuels, we only get 0.9 cents per kilowatt, but although there are bills to change that, bring us on parity with wind. Unfortunately, for tribes, this is only available to tax, taxable entities. And these, you, know, you really need these, to, to, uh, these tax credits to make these things work. What we do need is probably a policy, and I know that NCAI and others have put, put, proposed these to, monet, to allow tribes to monetize the production tax credit, get on an even footing with other taxable entities. At Warm Springs, what we have done to mitigate this issue is that we're going to set up with the LLC that I'm managing as a partner and bring up a, a, a taxable entity as a major partner and pass it through as an equity uh, pass-through. 
but we can talk about it later. That's not today's point discussion. Okay, benefits of woody biomass power from waste energy. Energy production benefits, rural economies. Uh, we can develop jobs and tax base. There was a study done by Greg Morris in 1999 that shows about that there's about 4.9 jobs created for every, mega, uh, every megawatt of forest biomass power created. So that's significant. A lot of these jobs are in the woods, as you can imagine. Our uh, base load is or dispatchable energy, which is very important for the grid to have that. Avoided emissions from fossil fuel uh, energy production. In our plant, for example, by offsetting natural gas plant, we're going to offset about 73,000 tons of carbon a year. And that's quite a bit. That's even including an offset for diesel fuel used to deliver and harvest the fuel. And also increased energy and diversity and security, which we all know that we want right now. Uh, benef other benefits, forest benefits, we see that if we can be able to use the biomass out of the woods efficiently, we can improve forest health. Uh, we can improve watershed production and quality. In fact, I work with a biologist out of the Northern, who works in Northern California, and he says with the added tool of biomass uh, as a marketplace, he's not managing just two or three species, he's actually managing 300 species now. So that's, uh, that's very nice. Uh, reduced emissions from open burning of forests. You know, open burning, as studies have shown, is as much as 100 times more, uh, has 100 times more conventional pollutants than controlled combustion or gasification. And this is, you know, just, I'm sure anytime, I don't know where you live, but where I live in Bend, Oregon, when the forest service starts to, to burn, I know it, and I start coughing. Uh, in fact, I've been coughing all day, I don't know. Uh, reduced emissions from cast rocket fires. Here's just a chart kind of illustrating that 100 times cleaner. Getting back to urban land base, actually there's a lot of, uh, there's benefits of, of burning urban wood. And one of them is uh, just the landfill diversion. You just don't fill up the landfill space as quickly. And that's very important to anyone who's managing landfills or concerned about the fact that we're creating all these spaces where we have our society garbage. And then, plus, it produces greater, uh, if left in the, in the, uh, in, in the landfill to biodegrade, it creates more harmful bio, uh, greenhouse gases then, then brought to a combustion center. In 19, as I mentioned earlier, Greg Morris in 1999 for the National Renewable Energy Lab did a paper on forest biomass and he found that uh, this is just uh, environmental benefits, that there's about 11.4 cents per kilowatt average in public benefits uh, <coughs> to, uh, uh, from burning uh, forest biomass. And this is because we have uh, carbon, et cetera. Now, if you consider that we're only getting paid uh, six, six to five cents for the electricity value, there's a lot of uh, public benefits created from these plants that's not being compensated. Uh, even though we have a 0.9 cent uh, production tax credit, that isn't uh, nearly enough to compensate these plants for all the benefits. I think, though, they are a good idea if we can make them economically sustainable. This kind of goes to Dean uh, Baer's uh, earlier presentation on sustainable businesses. I believe that the biomass produce pre presents a sustain what I call the sustainable trifecta, and that's uh, dealing with e economics, environment, and, so and social issues. In the case of economics, if we can make the production tax credits and others make this thing work, it can be a long-term uh, economic venture for the tribes. Environmentally, it uh, not only takes care of carbon, but it also or reduces carbon footprint, but it also allows an outlet for dealing with the forest, uh, forest resource issues we have, and socially we can create long-term long -term, uh, family wage jobs from these organizations. So my recommendation, let's implement the tri trifecta, implement economic solutions that are socially, sound, or socially and environmentally sound. We don't have to sell our soul to make profits. Uh, challenges, now challenges to this is absurd, uh, sure access to long-term biomass supply, even though there are stewardship contracts, the U.S. Forest Service might consider setting up 20-year agreements with tribes or whoever to allow this process to go on. Uh, we need public policy supporting biomass energy. Uh, for example, example uh, policy now allows utilities that, that can have policies that will focus them that they want to own these plants rather than to deal with the inter, in, uh, independent power purchase uh, provider. I think we need to have regulations that allow stimulation of in, 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 independent power developers. And then energy market issues, of course, I mentioned that earlier, they just, don't real, they just don't pay for all the benefits that these plants can provide to society. And of course, we have several R&D needs, uh, emerging energy technology, forest restoration, fuel treatment needs, harvesting technology. Now, where are we going with biomass? Of course, I'm going to say we're going to have more biomass electricity plants, and they're going to be more co-located co with uh, plant other, uh, other uh, 
plants, uh, sawmills, and so on and so forth. But in fact, I was listening to a, a man from representing Pacific Corps in Oregon, and that's exactly their plan. They, where they're facing a renewable portfolio standard, which requires that the utility buy a certain percentage of their power for, on a renewable basis. And one of their strategies, they said, hmm, look at all those sawmills. We could go from one after another and, and create power. So there is a strategy to do that right now. Other than that, the president's goal is to have 30% of transportation fuels uh, from, uh, from biomass. They're really looking at ethanol right now. And if you look at 30%, that's a billion board feet. I wonder how the USDA knew of that beforehand. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, what they are missing here is potentially another old alcohol that we all know about as foresters and land resources, and that's methanol. And methanol has been proven as a very good transportation fuel, been proven as a carrier for hydrogen, for batteries. There's just an unlimited, limited amount of uses for biomethanol, and the technology is, is almost there to create the marketplace for that. And I think we're missing the boat there. So to kind of conclude, biomass energy uh, can help solve forest health problems. It can create jobs. It can produce renewable energy. Uh, being involved with the energy field can maximize opportunities for tribes to create sustainable businesses. Uh, the biomass energy sector will move forward with or without the tribes. So I think this is an opportunity to make that decision. And we also will see the value of wood waste rise as a result of this uh, energy economy that's creating. Uh, policies that even the playing field for tribes are definitely needed. So when I look at the, the whole renewable energy scene and I think about the things that we want to, want to achieve, you know, more energy security, diversity in energy, better environment, stop the global warming. I'm thinking about this quote from Gandhi, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. And I think right now with the opening with the biomass energy as a tool for creating sustainable businesses, this is an opportunity for tribes to be part of that change. But anything you do, if you want to create the change, I think individually we must all take part in that. And whether you buy you know, renewable energy from a utility or, from, or you buy carbon mitigations from native energy, which is actually owned by a tribe, I think we all need to take that step. We must be the, part, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. Thank you. <laughs>